Scripture reading this evening is found in Exodus 33 and 34. We'll begin reading in Exodus 33 at verse 12. Exodus 33, verse 12, and read through verse 9 of Exodus 34. The text is most of that section. We won't reread that, and I'll pay uh, or read in the course of the sermon enough of it that we see what it is of God's Word that I'm preaching. The history here is Israel at Mount Sinai. God has just delivered Israel from the land of Egypt, brought them through the Red Sea, and they turned south to park at Mount Sinai where Moses went up to the top of the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments from God. And while, they, while Moses was there, we all know, Israel committed one of the most abominable sins that a people could commit. They made idols, they danced naked around those idols, and they worshipped those idols in an orgy-like feast. Moses has tried to remedy the matter. He's found no remedy so far. And that's where God appears to Moses, and the conversation begins as we have it in verse 12. Exodus 33, verse 12. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken. For thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, now Moses speaking again, verse 18, and Moses said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, now God speaking, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and I will take mine hand away, and thou shalt see my back parts but my face shall not be seen. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest. And be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai, and present thyself there to me in the top of the mount. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount. Neither let the flocks nor herds feed before the mount. And he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up unto Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand the two tables of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed... The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. 
And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us. For it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. That's the reading, and that's the text of God's Word for the sermon tonight. Moses had good reason to say to God, Show me your glory. Show me your glory. That is, I need to see your face. Show me what you look like. The reason Moses had that urgent petition before God was that Moses was doubtful that God would actually go with them and bless them and do good to them. And Moses had reason to be doubtful because they had just committed one of the grossest, vilest sins that a church could ever commit. I said that at the beginning of the reading. God had just revealed himself to them at the mount. Moses went to get the commandments at Mount Sinai and the people of Israel said to Aaron, make a golden calf that we may bow down to and worship because we don't know where Moses went. And they stripped themselves naked and in an orgy-like party committed abominable sins before Jehovah God. What aggravated the sin is that God had been good to them. God had just redeemed them by a strong arm and a stretched out hand. God was a caregiver to them between Egypt and Sinai. He opened the heavens and rained down manna. He opened the rock and gave them water. He was their caregiver God. And when they got to Mount Sinai, He said to them explicitly, I am your God. You are my people. And the people all responded, whatever you command, we will do. And as soon as Moses left, they worshiped idols. It's not surprising that Moses is doubtful whether God is actually going to go with them and do them good. And what aggravates Moses' doubt is that he had tried to remedy this matter three or four ways and nothing had helped. Just think of the history. When Moses was coming down from the mount, that's in the preceding chapters, he made a beautiful prayer. Based that prayer on God's election, on God's own name and so forth. And God's response to that prayer is that he repented of the evil that he thought to do to them. But when, God got, when Moses got to the bottom of the mountain, he knew that the matter was not resolved. He ground up the image to powder, made the people drink it, gathered the Levites together and had them slay 3,000 of the most impenitent sinners, and yet the matter was not finished. He got up the next morning, went up to the top of the mount, saying to the people as he left, Maybe I can make atonement for you. And he prayed the most beautiful prayer recorded so far in the Old Testament. God, forgive them. And if you can't merely forgive them, I'm willing to be blotted out from thy book for their sake. And usually when we preach on that, we forget that the answer of God to that beautiful prayer was... Him that sinneth, he will pay. And Moses went down from the mound unsatisfied, uncertain whether God would actually go with him and do them good. And so God told Moses one more time, take the tabernacle, pitch it outside of the camp, and everyone who's truly penitent come out to me and show that penitence by that coming out. And they streamed out of the camp and returned back into the camp. And that's where Moses now is speaking to God. Asking God, show me your glory. Let me see your face. Because it's only by seeing your face am I able to know whether I can tell the people that you're really going to go with us or not. Because if you're not going to go with us, then don't even carry us up from here. And I certainly don't want to be the leader of this people. Show me your glory. The bold request that Moses made here has a surprising answer 
But though it's a surprising answer, it gives the people of God a very, very blessed assurance about whether God will be with them or not. And you understand how applicable this is for the church of Christ today. But remember the context of this petition. Here's Israel having committed a vile, vile sin, ashamed in their sin, doubtful completely whether God will be with them and do them good. And Moses asks on their behalf, let me see the attitude of your face toward us. And then we'll know, are you going to go with us and do us good or not? Show me thy glory is the theme of the sermon tonight. A bold request, a surprising answer, and a blessed assurance. Moses makes a bold request here. Let me see your glory. That is, I want to see your face. Now, that's a surprising request too because Moses has just seen God. And if you read the preceding history, you maybe ask yourself when you come to this point, what in the world is Moses asking? He's already visited God. He's already stood with God and spoken to God face to face and mouth to mouth as a man speaks to a man. Now he's asking something different. Read Exodus 24 when you get home this evening and see the early history of their stay at Sinai. When God said to Moses, take Aaron and Aaron's two sons and the 70 elders and meet me at the top of the mountain and we're going to speak together. And you read in that chapter 24 of the most beautiful scene where around a table all of those men sat with God and had a covenant meal with God. With God Himself. Under His feet were a sea of crystal as it were. It's almost a heavenly kind of scene. They saw God. Two different verbs are used there to describe that reality. And even though they saw God, Exodus 24 said, God did not lay His hand upon them to destroy them. You read about the Israelites at the base of the mountain that they saw God too, but they only saw God in thunder and lightning and fire and smoke. But Moses, Aaron, Aaron's two sons and the seventy elders sat down and ate with God. In Numbers 12, that also records this history, God came to Moses, Aaron and Miriam and communicated with them it says mouth to mouth. That is, speaking so closely that they were able to communicate personally. As a man, it says there, speaks to a man. Hundreds of years before this, Jacob testified that he saw God face to face. What's Moses asking here? To see that the people of God hadn't already seen. And even in the verse preceding the reading of this evening, verse 11, you read the very same thing. In this very meeting, Moses is speaking to the Lord face to face. Now he says, let me see you. Let me see your glory. What Moses and all these others saw prior to this is a similitude of God. That's the key to this. Numbers 12 even says that. A form of God is what a similitude of God means. That is, they saw a form of God that made God appear like a man. When they looked at God, they thought they were looking at a man, a glorious man, a powerful man, a man perhaps whose brilliance was so bright that they couldn't even keep their eyes open but nevertheless a man. You children and young people remember that when God came to Abraham in his old age, walked across the desert with two others, and said to Abraham in that meeting, your old wife is going to have a baby. That's the time that uh, Sarah laughed. That, Moses, that Abraham thought that he was speaking to another man, three men. And had God not said that, Moses, uh, Abraham might not even have known that that was God. And although the setting of that meeting with Moses and the 70 elders was breathtakingly beautiful, that's what they saw there too. 
a similitude of God. And now Moses is asking for something more. Moses is saying to God, as it were, I know you're not a man. I know you're not like us. I know you have to appear to us like that so that we can bear speaking to you. Take off your veil now. I want to see you as you really are. I want to see, have a vision of your unveiled glory. And that's a bold request that Moses is making to God. And then you understand why God treats the request of Moses as he treats it. I'm going to make, God says now to Moses, I'm going to make all my goodness pass before your face. He really says that literally, before your face. Verse 19, but you cannot see my face because no one can see me and live. Now that's the difficult concept. No one can see me and live. Likely means no one can see me as I am essentially. No one can see me in my unveiled glory and survive. So this is what I propose to you. I'll hide you in a cave in the top of the mountain where I appear. I'm going to pass by you with my hand covering you in all of my glory. And when I pass by you, I'll uncover you and you can see my backside. And that's what you are permitted and able to see. But you cannot see my undiminished glory. The theological biblical truth here is that no creature is able to bear the sight, the full essence of the Creator God and live. Now I want to explain that very carefully. No creature is able to see the full essence of the Creator and survive. I don't mean by that that a sinner is not able to stand before the Holy God and survive. That's true too, but that's not what God is speaking about here. A while back I preached on the history of Nadab and Abihu, those priests, the sons of Aaron, who tried to come into God's presence with their own fire, strange fire, not the fire that consumed the sacrifice that was a substitute for them. They tried to appear in the presence of God on their own. And the fire of God came out of the tabernacle of God and consumed them because God is holy and we are sinners. And the only way we can come into the presence of God is covered by the righteousness of Christ. That's another truth, though. That's not what's going on here. What this truth is teaching is that even apart from sin, a creature is not able to behold the Creator and survive. If you children know what the angels do in the presence of God, you can understand this. You remember, children, that the book of Isaiah says about angels that they have six wings. With two of their wings they fly. With two of their wings they cover their feet. And with two of their wings in the presence of God they cover their faces and say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of thy glory. That's the key word in the text here. The angels who don't have any sin and who have no defect in their vision, the angels need to cover their faces in the presence of God because the glory of God would consume them. He's the Creator, and we're the creatures. I think sometimes that God made the sun as an earthly illustration. The sun is in its relationship to our earthly eyes as an illustration of God before us. Now think about the sun for a moment. We don't usually want to look at the sun, though when it appeared this afternoon it was a glorious appearance again after so much clouds, but no one is tempted usually to look directly up into the sun, except when there's an eclipse. And then you read, as that eclipse comes, 
days in advance, you read in the paper and on the news, don't look at the sun. Look indirectly at what the sun does and then you can see the eclipse. Why? Because these earthly eyes can't bear the glory of that ball in the sky. It'll destroy our eyes. They don't have the capacity. All right? Now think of that. The next time there's an eclipse, not only that you'll destroy your earthly eyes by looking directly at the sun, but that that's an illustration of us standing before God. We can't bear the full vision of God in His undiminished glory. So God says, I'll show you my backside. He'll cover Moses in the cliff of the rock when his face passes by, but when his face is passed, he'll uncover Moses and let Moses see his back. Now that's an anthropomorphism, a big word that we ought to know what it means, an anthropomorphism. Just a fancy way of saying that sometimes the Bible describes God in terms of a man. The Bible gives God body parts like men have body parts. Eyes, ears, nose, mouth, hands. Even though God isn't a man, and we all know that, sometimes God is described as a man to help us understand who God is. That's an anthropomorphism. When, God, when the Word of God says that God's eyes behold and His eyelids try the children of men, you mustn't think that God has eyes like ours with eyelids that blink because God isn't a man. But you must not forget that God has the eyes of which these earthly eyes are but little pictures. When the Word of God says that when you cry to Him in your distress, He hears you. His ears are open to your cry. You mustn't suppose that God has ears like this. He isn't a man who has ears like this, but you must not ever forget that God has the ears, the ears of which these earthly ears are but little pictures. And so when the Word of God says here that God has a face, no one shall see my face and live, and that God has a backside that also teaches us something about God. God has one way in which we would see everything about Him and another way in which we see much about Him. We understand that too. A couple of months ago when I injured my back and I wasn't able to attend church, I watched your service live streamed on the internet. Very thankful for that ability. Your camera is right there. But the angle on your camera is wide enough that many of you toward the back are visible. And I could recognize, even from your back, most of you without seeing your face. I imagine that some of you who attend church here regularly and sit in the back would be able to do that with just about every member. You don't need them to turn around to recognize who they are, to know something about them. That's so-and-so, that's so-and-so, that's so-and-so. We recognize something about each other from the back. and That's what the Word of God is teaching us here. Even from His backside, Moses is going to learn something beautiful about God himself. So God said to Moses, go up to the top of the mountain, bring two blank tablets of stone. I'll hide you in a cliff of the rock and I'll pass by you and then I'll lift my, my hand and I will show you my glory. I'll show you my glory. And now I want to read the text at its heart and while I read it, have you answer the question what did Moses see? I want you children and young people to think about that. When I read this vision, what's the answer to that question? What did Moses see? So that when you go home tonight and your parents ask you, when God lifted that hand from Moses and Moses looked and saw God, what was it that Moses saw? You be ready to answer them. The Lord descended, this is verse 5 of Exodus 34, 
The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. What did Moses see? Moses had to go down from the mountain now after another brief prayer. His two sons at the base of the mount probably asked him, Dad, what did you see? You asked God to see him. God said, I'm going to show you my glory. Dad, what did you see? What was Moses' response? Did he have nothing to say? What did Moses see? He didn't even say, this is how bright the light was. Moses had not one word to say with regard to the physical description of God because everything he needed to know about God was in these words that describe God's name and character. God showed himself to Moses by declaring to Moses his name. And that's beautiful. That means that there aren't two things going on in this history. One thing, God showed Moses something, and another thing, God spoke to Moses something else. No, it's one reality. Put together in this statement of verses 5, 6, and 7, God showed Moses who he was by declaring to Moses his name. And that declaration of God's name is the most beautiful vision anyone could ever see. To understand that, think of three things here. Now you have to think carefully, but it's not difficult to understand. To put this together, think first that God's glory is His weight. That's easy enough. God's glory is His weight or His weightiness. That's the meaning of that word in the Hebrew. Literally, glory means weightiness. God is the heavyweight. That's why the Bible describes all the idols as vanities, but breaths. They're nothing. They're insubstantial. They're worthless. But God is the heavyweight. He's valuable. He's worth something. You children know that at Christmas time, don't you? If a present under the tree that maybe dad and mom said, don't touch. You dare touch anyway, and you find that it's very light. Feels like nothing's in it. You're disappointed. But if it's heavy, you say, oh, that's going to be a good present. The Bible describes God as a heavy weight. His glory, number one, is His weight. Number two, what makes God a heavy weight is His goodness. What gives God value and worth is that He's good. Remember that too. Secondly, what makes God a heavyweight is His goodness. And that's the key to the text. We know that by comparing chapter 33, verse 19 with chapter 33, verse 22. God said in verse 22, It shall come to pass while my glory passes by, but He also said in verse 19, I will make my goodness pass by. That is, what makes me worth something, a heavy weight, valuable to you, is that I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Say that over and over and over again. So that's second. First, God's glory is His weightiness. Second, His weightiness is His goodness. And third, his goodness is described to us by His names. 
His goodness is described to us by having us hear His names. And that's peculiar. But it's not difficult to understand because we use the name, the word name that way too. If you children go to school, perhaps to Covenant for the first time after you've been in Hope or Heritage or some other school, and after you've been there for a couple of months, your parents sit you down and say, now I want to know what kind of name you're getting at Covenant. You know very well that they ground you if you'd simply give your parents your first name. You know very well that they mean something other than the name that's written on your birth certificate. They're asking you what kind of reputation do you have at school? What do the teachers and what do the other students think of your character? What kind of name do you have? And that's what the Word of God means here in the text. God's goodness is shown to us in His name, and His name is His character, His reputation, what He's like, how He works, how He acts toward us, and so forth. That's why Psalm 8 says what it does. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is Thy name in all the earth. And then it goes on to describe God's creation. How excellent is your name? Yes, in the sun and the moon and the stars and the beauty of the creation. That's describing God's name because it describes God's works. Now the vision begins to make sense, doesn't it? And the lack of a physical description of God is not puzzling, is it? God says to Moses, I'm going to show myself to you. And then he begins to list his attributes. Well, that's exactly what we need to hear. And the very first attribute he lists in the text is mercy. Now put that in the context a moment. Mercy. Moses is at the top of the mount pleading on behalf of of a miserable, sinful people down below who are raw in the knowledge of their sin and so full of shame because of what they've done, they're thinking God will never go with us and give us rest. The promises He made to us, He can't keep. And the very first word that God says to Moses is merciful. And so important is that attribute that He repeats it in the next verse keeping mercy. You see that in verse 7? Keeping mercy for thousands, but merciful. Merciful. Let that sink in for a moment. Mercy is the will of God to lift a miserable people up out of their misery and cause them to taste how good He is. Mercy is pity. Mercy is compassion. Mercy is feeling sorry for someone. We all understand what mercy is. A heart that goes out to someone who's suffering. A heart that does not only feel their suffering like they feel it, but a heart that says, I'm going to do everything that I can to lift them up out of that suffering and cause them to taste my own blessedness. The very first word God said to Moses, bring back down to the people, this is who I am, merciful. How is it that God shows that mercy of lifting them up out of their misery? By forgiving them. Keep reading. There it is. Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Why is it that God uses their three different words to describe sin? Iniquity and transgression and sin. It's because the reality of our experience when we sin and we're feeling low, every dimension of sin comes before our minds. This is how God says, I'm going to lift you up out of your misery. I'm going to forgive. I'm going to declare you're righteous. I'm going to take away your guilt. I'm going to impute to you the righteousness of my own son. And you need to know that that's how I see you every time I look at you. Beginning to see what God looks like? merciful, forgiving. And then before you suppose for a moment that He's merciful 
to you and forgiving because there's something in you. He says, gracious. That is, good to those who don't deserve to have good done to them. No one may suppose for a second that God's mercy is for those who deserve to have mercy. His forgiveness is to those who deserve to be forgiven. It's all to undeserving sinners. And there Israel spreads out on the plain before the mount, thinking, is God going to do good to us? We don't deserve it. No, he's going to destroy us. And then down comes from the mountain Moses saying, I saw God, and this is what I saw. He's merciful. He's gracious. He's forgiving. He's patient. We could spend a sermon on each of these attributes, but just look at a couple of these others. He's not quick to punish. He's slow to anger. And his goodness and his truth are abundant in him. That is, they fill him up and they overflow out of him. Abundant in goodness and truth. And all of that, people of God, because of the name, the name that the word of God gives to us for him. He's Jehovah. Jehovah. That's repeated in the text. At the very beginning, the Lord passed by him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord. That is, know me as the eternal, unchangeable, ever faithful God of friendship. And in that friendship that I have established with you, I am first of all merciful. I forgive, and I do that in my grace. And a blind man can respond to that and say, I have seen God. I've seen him. I know what he looks like. And then we need to be careful because you haven't seen God yet in all his beauty. There are two other attributes that make the background the dark black background of these positive, brilliant attributes of God that we might call positive. And those other two attributes are His sovereignty and His righteousness. Start with His righteousness. I almost wish sometimes when I read verse 7 that it would end in the middle. But it doesn't. I wish it would just read this way, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, period. But there's no period there, there's a comma. And it goes on to describe God in terms that I'm not very happy with sometimes. He will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. And my initial reaction is, but God, you are now taking back with the left hand what you just gave us with the right. You said you were forgiving, merciful, and gracious, and now you are saying you will by no means clear the guilty. You're going to visit the iniquity of the fathers, even upon the children. What do I believe here? Are you forgiving or are you not forgiving? And there comes the reality, the truth that is described in our Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Days 4, 5, and 6, that God is just. And God will have His justice satisfied. He will by no means merely clear the guilty. He doesn't just wink at your sin. He doesn't overlook your transgression and your iniquity. He punishes it. And that's why, and now you read in Exodus, keep on reading. The very next chapters, God says, build the tabernacle. And at the door of the tabernacle put the altar. And on the altar put a substitute for you. And I'm going to destroy that substitute instead of destroying you. There's justice in God. And that forms the background of God's beauty. You want to see Him in His grace, in His mercy, in His long-suffering patience and goodness? You must see Him on the background of His justice who will by no means merely clear the guilty. And the other attribute is his sovereignty. It comes out in the, the end of chapter 33 where God says in verse 19, Remember Moses, I'll be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Ever had anybody ask you where you're going? 
and you don't want them to know where you're going, so you simply respond, I'm going where I'm going. What are you doing? I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And whether that's polite or even proper for you to do, what you are doing is establishing your sovereignty in your own little circle. I will do what I will do. I will go where I will go, and no one may question me. I remind you again, whether that's proper for us ever to do, and it isn't ever proper for children to do that before their parents, that's what God is doing because God is sovereign. So that the other part of this dark background is the reality that God will show mercy to and God will be good to whom He will. And you recognize this is the passage from which Paul quotes in Romans 9 and 10 and 11 with regard to God's counsel of election. God will show mercy to whom He will show mercy. But on that dark black background of His sovereignty and on his ju of His justice stands these beautiful virtues of God that show us His character. He's good. And His goodness makes Him the worthwhile, substantial, valuable God to us that He is. A child can say, I've seen God. You ever envy Moses? You ever wish that you could go back and climb a mountain like that and see what Moses saw? Don't ever wish that. Because what you and I see now is far, far more beautiful than what Moses saw. Remember that in quotation marks. Nothing with these eyes. What Moses saw then. You and I see now in quotation marks. And see with our ears more than anything else, but also with our hearts, something far more beautiful than what Moses saw then because we see God in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's not anything profound to you until you really think about it for a moment. I want to quote three New Testament texts that make that so clear and beautiful. You will go home tonight thinking of something that you've never realized before, perhaps. When the apostle said to the church of the Hebrews, in Hebrews 1 verse 1, what he did, they must have gotten the chills thinking about this history of Moses. I'm going to paraphrase it for you, and then I'm going to quote it more directly. But this is how Paul begins. He says to the church there in Hebrews, in many different ways, and in many various times in the past, God spoke to us by the prophets. But today, God has spoken to us by His Son. All right? See that distinction. In past time, God spoke by the prophets. Today, God speaks to us by His Son. And now listen to how God describes that Son. He is the brightness of God's glory. The same word. He's the brightness of God's glory. He's the express image of His person. Do you want to see God? Look at His Son. And then think about what Paul said to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 6. God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You want to see God? Look at His Son. God shine. And God shined the light of the knowledge of His glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Now those two might be more obscure passages. Think of the more familiar passage in John 1.1. 1, 1. You children have learned that at school and in catechism. Now think again what it says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All right, remember, the Word was God. And then jump down to verse 14. You've memorized that too. And the Word became flesh. God became a man and dwelt among us, lived right with us. And John says, we beheld His glory. Let that sink in. 
John is thinking about this vision of God to Moses in Exodus 34. He said, God came down, dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. And then notice he doesn't say anything about a physical description. Six feet tall, 180 pounds, muscular, angular jaw, dark hair, light hair. He says not one word about that physical description of Christ. He goes on to say, we beheld his glory full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. Full of goodness, faithfulness, mercy, and kindness. You want to know what the Lord Jesus looks like? Don't ever describe him in a physical way. Describe him how he was described in the New Testament. This is what he, quote, looks, end quote, like. He was full of the attributes of his Father in heaven. And when you see Jesus, the face of Jesus, that way, you will say, I've seen God. And it's in Jesus that that puzzling combination of the positive and negative in verse 7, forgiving iniquity, and yet who will by no means clear the guilty. It's in Jesus that both of those realities come to pass. In him, God's justice was satisfied. He didn't merely clear the guilty. He is Jesus, the Son of God, is the substitute provided for us. And when you see in him the face of God, you see all all of the attributes of God that make God the beautiful God that he is. You think of what John saw in his vision in Revelation, the last book of the Bible, where in symbolic language he says, I turned to see the voice that spake with me. This is chapter 1, the very beginning of Revelation. And I saw... This is a vision, it's all symbolism, but think of the significance of the symbolism. I saw in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, one like the Son of Man. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his countenance was as the sun. We, we people of God can see the sun, the sun, the Son of God, S-O-N, is the fulfillment of that unseeable sphere in the heavens that would destroy us. The Son of God is the revelation of all of the glory and the beauty of God. Children, don't ever, ever, ever ask your parents what God looks like again. If you mean, draw me a picture of him. Tell me how big he is. What color is he? How tall is he? How much does he weigh? Don't ever ask your parents again, what does God look like? And if you do, then your parents are going to bring you to Exodus 34 and say, this is the description of God. And then they're going to take you to John 1 and show you Jesus. And if you say, draw me a picture of Jesus, I'd like to know what that man looks like, then you will have your parents say to you, there's no physical description that the Word of God gives of this man. There ought not be, because as our catechism says, God neither can nor may be represented by images. So don't give him dark skin. We don't know what color skin he wa had. Don't give him long hair. He certainly wasn't a Nazarite. Don't make pictures of Jesus. When you want to see a vision of God, read of the attributes of the one who says to us, I'm merciful, I'm gracious, I'm long-suffering, I forgive iniquity and transgression and sin, and I punished all of those in the person and nature of my own Son. You imagine what Moses felt like after he made that prayer at the end of the vision? How old was this man by now? 
He's an old man already. But I can envision Moses so filled with eagerness and excitement to get down that mountain, he probably wanted to run and get down there and tell the people of God, you will not believe what I've seen. Stand aside, sons. I'll tell you more details later. I need to tell all of the people what I've seen. God's going to go with us and give us rest. And he certainly didn't say, let's have a big party and dance and drink because the knowledge of the sin in the people of God was far, far too raw. And they were far too sensitive and full of shame with the guilt that they had in their own hearts. But this is what they heard. God's going to go with us and give us rest. Imagine that sermon of Moses and the relief that flooded over the people of God. We don't deserve it. But God made His promises to us. And in His sovereignty, He's going to do us good. He's going to go with us and give us rest. You ever doubt? You see your sin and you know it's so shameful you hope no one ever knows what that sin is. You know it. I know mine. You know yours. And we as a church know ours. You ever doubt whether God's going to keep on going with you and give you rest? He's God. And His goodness to you and to me does not depend upon you and me, but it depends upon His Son, His very own Son. And that's the message that you need to hear every single Sunday. Make sure that the man who stands behind this pulpit every Sunday spends all kinds of time up on the mount seeing God so that he can come running down with enthusiasm that's barely concealable and stand before this pulpit and tell you people of God, God is good, God is gracious, God is merciful and the response we must give to him is not to try to work to gain his favor but to try to work to show that we are a thankful people and then every time we sin we're ashamed and every time we're ashamed we go back to the very same place, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you seen God? I hope so. I have. And He is a beautiful God. Trust Him. Love Him. Obey Him. And serve Him until He comes again in His Son. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank Thee for showing thyself to us in the face of thy Son. We're sorry for our folly, our many sins and iniquities and transgressions. We're ashamed of them. Teach us to confess them, to admit to them, if necessary, to each other, but especially, Heavenly Father, to thee, so that all of those sins in our consciousness may be laid upon the shoulders of thy Son who loved us and gave himself for us so that we could have mercy. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen.